from. Good morning, New Life Community Church. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. Can you hear me okay? Ooh. You can hear me out there? There we go. Can't turn myself up here. It's good to have everybody here. It's good to see the sun shining again. And we're so thankful for that. And uh, I don't know about you, but when we have too many cloudy days in a row, it seems to affect my mood, which it can... <laughs> cannot be pleasant some days, <laughs> but that's okay. Last week, we had just the most wonderful exercise in filling out those little papers. Do you remember that? And then bringing in them up and putting them in the basket at the cross and just kind of a symbolically releasing our burdens to the Lord. And, um, and of course, it was private. You didn't have to tell anybody what you'd written on your piece of paper, but I really want to share for myself because... Um, I think a lot of people also struggle with fear, and I, I was struggling with fear, honestly, and uh, didn't really realize that, but the Lord had really revealed that to me. And, um, and I know, you know, I stand up here week after week, and I encourage everybody in the Lord, but sometimes we deal with our stuff, and that's just okay. And, uh, but I had written that on there because uh, when you're afraid, it can sometimes it presents itself as, as anger or, you know, as complaining or something like that. And people will be like, man, you're in a really bad mood. What's the deal? I'm just mad. Well, no, actually, it's fear often. And so I was able to just put that out there and just, just release that. And then the Lord reminded me this week of the scripture that he had gave me before I moved to Canada. And um, my husband and I, we were engaged, and I was getting ready to come up here. But my sister had really put some fear in my heart. She was like, what if you get up there and he kills you? You know, it was just, <laughs> <laughs> takes you to the mountains and leaves you and then we never hear from you again. And, you know, she was, she was really, she was very afraid. She was afraid for her big sister to be moving away and she was afraid she would never see me again. But, you know, that kind of, uh, that fills your heart just like it fills other people's hearts, amen? You can, you can pass on your garbage to other people. Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't want to do that. I uh, didn't want to do that to y'all. But the Lord gave me a scripture at that time and, and as I was praying before I came up here. And it's uh, John 14 and verse 27. And, uh, and it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. The Holy Spirit gave me this word and said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, and neither let it be fearful. And in that moment, in that moment, the Holy Spirit just lifted all the anxiousness, all the fear, all the trepidation, and it's just like, it's going to be all right. I've got this. You don't need to be afraid. 
And um, so Sunday, I was able to, you know, all this COVID nonsense just kind of, it gets to you, it weighs on you, right? The last two years have been a challenge. And if somebody says they haven't been a challenge, I'm going to have to have a talk with you today. <laughs> I'm not going to believe that. But it's been a challenge. And for some of us, it's even been a fearful thing. And then you throw what's going on across the ocean and there. It's just a mess. The world is a mess. But Jesus has overcome the world. And he has said that he has come to give us life and that more abundantly. It's the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But we're conquerors, amen? We are victorious. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have a promise of eternal life. And that begins right here and right now. And so, um, so this week, I mean, these songs are just going to kind of be reflective of that because the Holy Spirit just really was wanting to bring some healing to my heart. And I'm just going to share that healing with you. If we can share our fears, we can share our healings. Amen. Amen. And that's where the, that's where the word uh, is so powerful in our lives. So let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we just want to bless you in this place this morning. We just want to say thank you. You are God and you are good and you love us. Lord, we just worship you in spirit and in truth in this place this morning. I just want to pray your blessing on each and every person that has come into this place today. Lord, that each and every person will be filled with your presence, that they will go out rejoicing, and that they will know that you are with them. You said you would never leave us. You would never forsake us. You're with us to the end of the age. You are a good God, and we are so grateful and so thankful this morning. So, Lord, I just want to bless you in this house, and I just ask for your your Holy Spirit to be present on each and every person in this place this morning as we worship you and exalt you and lift up your name. We give you all the glory now in Jesus' name. Amen.
of you can say you're a child of God in this place this morning. Hallelujah. 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 songs that wake you up. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we can, we can dance on those chains. We can, we can stand and we can say, devil, you lose. I win. And that's just the way it goes because Jesus is in us. Amen. Amen. Jesus is in us. And because he is in us, we can raise a hallelujah and we can worship the Lord. We can worship the Lord in the presence of our enemies. We can worship the Lord no matter what's going on around us. As a matter of fact, we're called to do that. Raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. 
place this morning. And we worship you in this house this morning. We say that great is our God and we love you and we praise you. We just want to say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
lift your name on high today. Lord, we just pray that you enter this building, Lord. We worship your name on high. Lord, oh, we just give you thanks to be here today, Lord. We give you thanks for this building. We give thanks for these congregants, Lord. We offer our hearts up to you today, Lord. Lord, can we say we're in a broken world right now? Heavenly Father, we just pray for healing. Just heal this nation, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that you just fill this nation with your spirit. Heal us, Lord. Like Isaiah, Lord, we just, here we are. Use me, use us, Lord. We pray that you remove any fear that might be in each of our spirits, Lord, that we can just, oh, Lord, go forward and preach the gospel. Lord, we want to glorify you. We ask that your gospel is every corner of the, the earth, Lord. We ask, Lord, for healing on this congregation. We ask for all oh, those people that are shut in right now. Lord, please, just we ask for your healing touch on them right now. People that are broken, people that are fearful. Lord, who their, their flesh is broken, Lord, we just... Ask for your healing on those people today. Lord, we pray for those in Ukraine. Oh, Lord. We're in a peaceful nation here, and we give thanks for that, Lord. We give thanks for that every day that we can worship you without any persecution. Lord, to those Christians now, though, that can't come and glorify your name openly. Those in the world, Lord, that that are just getting persecuted, Lord, or in the midst of war, we just pray for peace. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for revival. Lord, we pray that instead of war, they start to look towards you. They find just answers in you, Lord. We know you're seeking your people and you're drawing us together in your church. Lord, we pray that you be with us here today. Bless this building. We pray for just, Lord... Remove all fears and just fill us with the Holy Spirit today. Lord, we pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Well, good morning, New Life Community Church. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I just want to welcome you here, and I also want to uh, welcome those that are here online. So if you guys could just give a round of applause here, just let them know that you're here. That's awesome. So those that are online, don't adjust your sets by any means or your screens there. It's not that Pastor Hines shrunk a foot and a half. My name is Vince Krebs here. I'm just going to be walking you through here. Uh, Pastor Hines and his lovely wife Tammy here are taking some well-deserved holidays. So I've got a couple of announcements here, and hopefully I won't miss any of them here. Um, first off here, um, the AGM, March 27th. We have phase two of our AGM coming up, so that's three weeks' time. Uh, it's phase two. We just ask that the members stay uh, just after the worship service there. We've got some business to take care of. Also on the back uh, table, there's some packages that uh, will get you set up for that AGM. So make sure that you pick those up on the way out if you are a member. Secondly, congregational prayer here is uh, on its Saturday, 1030. Is that right, Donna? Yeah, 1030 here this Saturday. So we invite you to that as well. My last announcement is pretty exciting. For the last couple of years, New Life Community Church has uh, been in support of Moms Canada. So we've, uh, we've supported them over the last few years and everything like that. And so we've got some exciting news. We have a guest speaker here today. Sharice with uh, Moms Canada is going to come up and just give a bit of a, a presentation on that. We've got an exciting opportunity for us here coming up. So Sharice, come on up. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So yes, my name is Sharice, and I have the privilege of being the executive director for Moms Canada. 
Now, if you're not familiar with it, but it sounds like you are because you guys have been a great part of, of supporting moms. But Moms Canada is a faith-based nonprofit organization that offers emotional support and mentorship to single moms. Our slogan is actually, where single moms find hope. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. So I just have a few statistics here. Now, the Canadian Children's Rights Council says, fatherlessness is one of the greatest social problems in Canada. Just last year in 2021, there were 1.83 million single parent families in Canada, which had increased by almost half a million in just the last 15 years. In the same last year, uh, Alberta had almost 200,000 single parent families. 20% of all children are growing up in a single parent home. And only 5% of single moms attend church. Now that doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? <laughs> it kind of sounds sad, and I think it's, it's a wake up call for us, right? Um, I myself am a single mom, uh, and I, I struggle with, I have struggled over the last three years of, yeah, finding that hope and, and feeling alone, which is interesting because obviously we're not alone. Like, there's millions of single moms across the country. Now, um, I was actually at a co women's conference this weekend, and it was fantastic. And one thing that really spoke to me, there was a pastor, Pastor Nadim, or Vadim, sorry, and he s was from Ukraine, and they actually live called him in the conference and spoke with him. And um, his, Pastor Vadim's ministry has, has rescued over 136,000 families in Ukraine trying to evacuate the women and children. Um, you know, he said, when he was asked how he's doing and how he's feeling, he said, you know, even with all the chaos and, you know, the, the war on his country, he said, sometimes the presence of Jesus on the boat with you is not protecting you from the storm, but his presence comforts you and protects you from the boat sinking. And that's why Moms Canada is here. You know, we may not be able to fix all the struggles and all the problems. We may not necessarily be able to change some of those statistics, but what we can change is that single moms can know that they're not going through this alone and that there is hope in Jesus. Hopefully the one statistic we can change is that 5%. That's really what we do want to change. Um, we can share the good news with them. Um, and, you know, yeah. I, oh, there's a quote here I want to share. Sometimes God doesn't calm the seas, but he comforts his child. Now, what can we do? Well, <clears throat> Moms Canada is happy to announce that we have a new Empowered Moms program. This program is a 12-week program, and New Life Community Church has graciously offered to have us hold one of our sessions here. It's going to be an evening session, um, just working out the details of the date, so stay tuned for that, um, of the exact date and time. But it's going to be starting the beginning of April, 12-week session. And what does that look like? Well, single moms and loving mentors are going to gather here in the church around round tables, build community, which we have so been lacking over the last two years. Um, and we're going to uh, engage in relevant teaching, teaching that is going to be encouraging and helpful to these single moms. Uh, we also have a daytime session that will be running out of a Spruce Grove Alliance Church and a completely online version that will be held on Sunday evenings. Now, um, what do we need? Well, what do we need and how can we help? Well, that is where you can all come in. I'm sure if I were to ask you to put up your hands, every one of you must know a single mom. If not, you know me, then I'm a single mom. So everybody's going to put up their hands today, right? So um, how can we help? Well, we need mentors. We need child care workers. We need prayer partners and even snack providers. It's just a 13-week commitment. Uh, you'll have one week of training and then the 12-week session, or not a whole week of training, but <laughs> one week where you'll have a day of training. Um, and mentors can be anyone. You, you don't have to have come from a single 
family background or anything like that. You just basically have two requirements. You need to love Jesus and you need to love women. <laughs> Those are your requirements to be a mentor. So um, what did I want to, oh, the last thing, you know, and just to wrap up here. Um, so thinking to that storm, thinking to that boat, you know, like Pastor Vadim said, you know, you can still find hope in the midst of that storm. And there's a verse that I really spoke to me, Romans 15, 13. And I'm just going to read that here. It says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And to me, that picture is like a lighthouse. You know, in the midst of those raging seas, the lighthouses really are only important in the darkness and in the storms. And yet, like, God is that beacon of hope, and we can share that beacon of hope with single moms in our community. So if you have any questions, I'll be here after the service. Please come and talk to me and then look for more information on signing up to, to volunteer as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Sharice. You know, we talk about our, our vision 2024, and uh, boy, I can't see an opportunity here that doesn't fit the bill more than Moms Canada. What a great opportunity here. So 13 weeks, man, what can we say? What a just a great chance, an opportunity here to get involved with single moms. That is excellent. So this morning, guys, I've been fortunate enough uh, to have an opportunity to speak to you today. And it's interesting how this opportunity came about. Last year, I had it laid on my heart just before Christmas, actually, that I had to share a bit of my testimony. And it's also interesting how this opportunity seems to have come after a very relevant couple of sermons by Pastor Hines. If you recall, in the last two weeks, Pastor Hines has spoke about the importance of confession as a form of worship. Also, of course, paired with that is repentance. Turning away from sin. So I find this opportunity very timely, almost without planning, putting into practice what we heard in the past weeks, almost concluding this message, almost an extension of this message, by putting into practice through a testimony that isn't overly dramatic by any means. It is one, however, that involves some sadness, some unfaithfulness, and some sin. Giving a, a personal testimony isn't always that easy. Confessing to God is much easier. God is perfect in justice. He's perfect in mercy and forgiveness. But giving that testimony in front of a church can certainly be more difficult. Satan, of course, looks to promote fear, doubt, a lack of confidence, and uncertainty in a sinful, condemning world. But if we fall victim to what Satan wants us to believe, I would fail to share a testimony that glorifies God. And in my circumstance, it's a true testament of God's grace, God's faithfulness, God's sovereignty, and His forgiveness. It was quietly laid on my heart, it was rather selfish to keep what God has done in my life to myself. And maybe at some point in time I would approach Pastor Hines to say a few words. Well, I ignored that calling on my heart last year. But lo and behold, God works in mysterious ways. And here I am, given this morning to share a bit of my testimony with you. So thank you very much for being here today and listening. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Today I'm speaking on the evolution of my own faith in Christ. And to put it bluntly, for the majority of my life, I've struggled with a rather shallow and superficial 
understanding of God. Using my testimony then as an example, I'll show the consequences when we fail to pursue a deeper understanding of God and even give a couple of indicators that I noticed in my own behavior when we fail to pursue God on a deeper level. So if we speak about being a testament to your faith in Christ, the first thing that I have to address at the highest of levels is the concept of faith. And I'm going to use a worldly example, if I will. So just stick with me on this one here. I can't get past the amount of faith that it would take for a person to jump out of a perfectly good aircraft. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I tell you why, this is kind of a smaller crowd, but raise your hand if you've ever been skydiving before. Okay. I honestly am kind of shocked by that. I thought there would be no hands up, so I'm kind of ill-prepared for that. I was going to say how much sensibility you had because there's such a lack of hands, but good for you guys. That's excellent. But once I've thought what it would take to convince a person to jump out of a perfectly good aircraft for the first time, and I would expect before the first jump that you would at least research and at least get a, a superficial understanding of how the concept works. Maybe a little of the science behind how it works. Otherwise, you, you might jump out of the plane with nothing more than a knapsack full of books that explain gravity and science, right? There is then a level of trust in the operation, in the equipment that has to be achieved before one would agree to this. But where does this level of faith come from? If it's a first jump, certainly it's not from personal experience, rather through the testimony of those that had jumped before. Probably some investigations or interviews, maybe an inspection of the equipment. And for a select few, this may be just enough faith to take your first jump. But then after the first jump, assuming the safe opening of the parachute and the soft landing to the earth, there is now a, a personal experience, a personal testimony to the safety of the operation. A much deeper faith is then realized. There are two layers of faith then that are observed here. The early understanding and then eventually the deeper understanding that's rooted in experience. This could be used in some ways to explain our faith in Christ, but there's a major difference, and that is the first point of difference. Our faith in Christ comes to us through the sovereignty of God and through the action of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 7 to 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come on to you, but if I depart, I will send him on to you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This, of course, is referring to the role of the Holy Spirit in convicting our heart. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What I'm getting at here is that the works of the Holy Spirit in our lives differs greatly than the faith that we have in worldly things. When we look further into the scriptural definition of faith, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This, of course, is referring to the hope of our salvation that resides in Christ Jesus from the testimony of others. Presumably, that would be the apostles, those of the early church that testify and give evidence, sometimes that which we have not personally seen. We believe in the resurrection because we believe in the authority of Scripture. And we believe in the testimony of those that were witness to his crucifixion and his resurrection. While our initial salvation may come from the faith and the testimony of those 2,000 years ago, there's a further sanctification that happens when we have a personal relationship with God. It's the opening of the parachute. It's the safe landing to the ground, as it were. It's that faith that is then rooted in experience. How often do we resist seeking a deeper 
relationship with God. How many of us resist moving into that, that personal experience that happens when we pursue that relationship? How often do we resist the call of the Holy Spirit in our lives, resulting in what Paul describes in Romans as a seared conscience? There are implications for not going beyond what I would call a superficial understanding of who God is. When we fail to understand his character, we have a limited understanding of what glorifies him. If we have a limited understanding of what glorifies him, we may be very ignorant of the sin in our lives. This was the circumstance in my own life. For years, I had the attitude that God was irrelevant or only relevant on a Sunday. Most often at times in my life, even one day a week wasn't even honored. There can be pitfalls for someone that has known Christ as long as they can remember. Let me explain. I grew up with a father and a mother that loved the Lord. But there can be a complacency a searing of the conscience, as Pastor Hines put it in a previous message, from turning away from the calling of the Holy Spirit. Dulled, rendered insensitive to what was right and wrong, there was a resistance and a lack of a desire to know God beyond the day of my salvation. And there can be consequences for a superficial understanding of God's word, by the way. In the parable of the sower, For instance, in Matthew 13, Christ tells of the sower who spread the seed and some seed fell to the wayside and the birds snatched it up. Christ explains the parable again in Matthew 13, verse 19. When anyone hear the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Those that have heard the scripture, it has even been laid on their heart They have heard the witness and the testimony of those that were at Christ's death and resurrection, but they didn't look beyond that. They didn't seek to understand it. To use the analogy, they didn't go further to the opening of the parachute and the safe landing to the ground. They didn't seek to find understanding of God's character revealed in Scripture. And they didn't seek to understand the meaning of the gospel. And so the message is easily snatched away. I had the understanding of the witness of those in Scripture that professed of Jesus Christ in his resurrection. I'd even given my life to Christ early on. But I had stopped there. And because I hadn't pursued anything further, I lacked the personal testimony of God's work in my life. The opening of the parachute and the soft landing to the ground, as it were. Taking for granted my salvation failing to take the time that God had blessed me with to pursue him had led to some serious consequences in my life. I'm an environmental consultant. I clean up contamination as a job. And several years ago, I recall a time when God intervened in my life. On one particular job, things were not going well. Hot summer days resulted in almost daily massive thunderstorms. You know, those ones that build after 30 above days. And these storms would result in massive flooding of a building from which I was in charge of removing the contaminated soils. The drainage pipes came from a nice, tall, flat building, and it ran down through the building and out, and they had been cut accidentally. And it meant that every time that there was a a thunderstorm, it would build up. Thousands of gallons of water would come down to the building. It would flood the building, and it would turn it into a big, mucky monster. It cost thousands and thousands of dollars every rainstorm to clean the site up. I was a self-reliant and proud man, but more than that, at that time, I was leading a sinful life, an earthly life. When there's habitual sin in your life, there's little room for the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get real with you. Sexual impurity. Alcohol. Not in excess all the time, but sometimes. 
using the name of the Lord in vain constantly on the job site. You know, Jesus says, he says, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. And I tell you right now, if you've got that habitual sin in your life, you need to look after it because there's no room for the Holy Spirit if you're, if you're tending to that. The consequence of not pursuing a relationship with God is that we fail to realize how close God really is. I was a hair breadth away from quitting the project and shutting my business for good. And I remember looking out the window of the hotel in Medicine Hat on an evening seeing yet another massive thunderstorm building. A lack of sleep and ungodly life, immense pressure from my employer, and I'd had enough. I hit my knees and I leaned on the bed and I prayed. And I remember specifically the details of that prayer. Lord, am I even relevant to you? Does what I do even matter to you? That was the prayer. And I asked God for some sort of reassurance, some sort of indication that what I did was relevant and that it mattered to Him. A prayer like that certainly indicates the condition of my heart at that time of my life. It's certainly the prayer of a man that does not understand the character of God. In Matthew 16, verse 4, Jesus, when faced with the unbelieving Pharisees and Sadducees, said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. This prayer did not come from an unbeliever. It came from a proud, stubborn man that had hit rock bottom. And it was sincere, but it was mostly desperate. The rain began to fall shortly after, and that evening in discouragement, I drove back to the site and began pumping waters I had for the last few days. It was a short rain, the clouds passed, and when I had things under control for the day, as much as possible for that evening, I drove back to the hotel. And I remember looking at the passing clouds in the sky, and there was this bright, huge, arcing rainbow across the sky. How relevant was this? The promise given to Noah, a covenant, that he would not flood the entire earth again. How beautiful is it that we can see that promise today that was given thousands of years ago? I love rainbows. I just love them. They're just awesome. But guess how I responded to it? I remember looking up the sky and saying as I'm driving home, God, you're going to have to do better than that. (sighs) I was mocking God. The same man that asked for mercy a couple hours ago and asked for a show of relevance now mocked my Father in heaven. I drove into the hotel parking lot and the rainbow arched across the sky. This gets worse, trust me. And it was settled over a pizza restaurant of all the things. Bear with me. I hopped out of the truck and I pulled out my phone and I typed a message to Stephanie on my phone. And I said, this must be a sign that God, Stephanie, my wife here, she she knew the kind of rotten luck I was having on the site. And so I, I typed a message to her seeing this arching rainbow over the pizza establishment. I said, this must be a sign from God that I need pizza. You know, God is faithful when we pursue him, but more importantly, he is merciful. So I typed that message, and I raised the phone to take a photo of the rainbow near the pizza establishment, and a little closer inspection of the picture, and my jaw dropped, and my heart rejoiced. There's the picture, and there's actually a zoomed-in picture for those of you that couldn't see that on the other one. If that wasn't a miracle that only hours before, a desperate man asked for what relevance he had to the Father and whether the sinful life he was living even mattered to God, God answered in one fell swoop. And one of those miracles, those beautiful displays of divinity that only a loving God can supply. It should be noted that a few steps to the right or a few steps to the, the left and that rainbow doesn't line up. 
but standing in that exact place at that exact time, longing for an answer to the relevance that I had to my God, a man who had been brought to his knees with constant flooding, a more perfect answer could not have been had. God showed a level of mercy and grace that I certainly did not deserve that day, an all-powerful God a reminder of his control over his creation, a reminder of the covenant with Noah, a reminder of the cross and the promise of salvation through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. I've never questioned my relevance to God ever again. This had been a a personal encounter with God, a revelation of his character, a personal testimony of God's mercy and grace. In looking back at my own experience, there are two very obvious deficiencies in my life at that time. One, an unwillingness to pursue God through Scripture. And secondly, an unwillingness to commune with the Father through prayer. In my own past, I have sometimes avoided the Old Testament. It isn't always an easy read. The Old Testament, though, is ripe with the evidence of the sinful human condition, the evidence of God's righteousness, evidence of his mercy, evidence of his patience, evidence of his faithfulness to a chosen nation, but also evidence of his perfect and sovereign justice. It is ripe with prophecy and the promise of the coming Messiah. What kind of disservice was I doing to myself by avoiding this revelation of God's character? If you want a meaningful relationship with God, if you want to move beyond someone else's testimony, you have to be diligent of reading God's word. This was a key element. When I had fallen so far from God, I didn't seek truth in the scripture, or at most it was very sporadic. And I'm going to be very blunt here. The amount of time that you spend in the Word may be a pretty good indication of your spiritual health. Item number two, communion with the Father. Often, when we have a superficial understanding of God, we fail to seek communion with Him. Up until that single prayer of desperation, my prayer life was non-existent. If I had been seeking God in scriptures, I would have known the importance of a powerful prayer life. Colossians 4.2, continue in prayer and watch the same with thanksgiving. Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. There's also consequence when we do not pursue God through prayer. When we starve ourselves from communication with our Father. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We miss out on His blessings, we miss out on His miracles, we miss out on His comfort if we are not in communion with Him through prayer. I'm going to interject with another piece of testimony here, and this differs greatly from the previous experience, and that what could have been a time full of pain, full of grief, is very much a time of peace, a time of comfort, because I laid all my cares on him. Twelve years ago this May, when our daughter was born, she had a condition known as spina bifida encephaly. It's a condition in which the spinal cord fails to properly form fusion to the brain. The result is a fatal birth defect in which a child is born without a portion of the brain. It is what the doctors deem a condition that's incompatible to life. Once again, I found myself on my knees, praying for comfort, praying for wisdom, and praying for direction most of all. Concluding my prayer In opening my Bible, I can really only say my eyes supernaturally fell on the verse of Matthew 19, verse 14, directly after the prayer. But Jesus said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. The funny thing is, 
supernatural thing is, is below in the study notes of my Bible, for some reason there's an additional note, maybe even outside of the context of that scripture. It's a further explanation labeled infant salvation. There's no greater level of peace that comes than that which comes from God when he reveals in scripture his heart for the little children. I held our daughter for four hours until she passed away into my hands. But in full assurance that she passed from my hands and into his. Sometimes we don't understand that our salvation, as well as many other things, is entirely relevant to the sovereignty of God. And we may find ourselves asking the question, why do things like this happen? Let me read you a little further into the notes that offered comfort that day around the Matthew 19, verse 14 passage. This isn't scripture, this is in the sub-notes. Children who die before the age of accountability go to the presence of God and are considered safe in Jesus rather than using the traditional word saved. This is based on the nature of God who would not condemn anyone who lacked the ability to respond. There's an application below that, and it says... Sometimes God will allow tragic events like the death of a child to enter our lives so that we can understand and appreciate his comfort and be prepared to comfort others in time of need. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we ourselves are comforted of God. God may put us through trials for the comfort of others. Many of you are aware of the ministry of Isabella's Blankets here at the church. Stephanie started this after we lost Isabella, but before when she was in the hospital, Stephanie stitched two small blankets, one that stayed with our daughter, and an identical one that she would keep in remembrance. And today, the wonderful wonderful people of our church get together and they sew pairs of blankies for other families that will go through the same experience. There are blankies that get prayed over and sent to several Edmonton hospitals a couple times a year. We have some here today, and we're going to pray with those in a minute. It involves the caring people of our church helping to comfort so many families that may not know God, but at least are offered a small invitation to his overwhelming comfort and love. To date, our church has provided over 2,000 pairs of blankets. That's 4,000 blankets given to grieving families with beautifully handmade cards that supply links to support services for grieving families. Glory to God, God is faithful in his promises, isn't he? Seeking his truth in scripture, communion with him in prayer. If we do not study the character of God in scripture, how do we know what glorifies him? When we study the scripture, when we are in prayer and supplication to him, when we accept the mercy he has offered in the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ, then fulfilling the two most important commandments comes a whole lot easier. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And it leads to the fulfillment of ministries in our church. I'm going to wrap up uh, uh, right away here, but when we seek the Lord, he's faithful. And he turn, in turn provides a sanctification, a setting apart, a purification of his people. It's the growing of a personal testament of his glory. And when we pursue him in prayer and in scripture, he is faithful in comfort, in mercy, and in grace. Maybe today there's those of you who can relate to being self reliant, prideful disobedient, like I have been, despite what Christ has done for you? Maybe today is the day you want to finally hand the helm over to God. To finally honor and glorify Him 
and maybe you struggle with how to do that. Can I say a start? We'll be hitting your knees and talking to your Father in heaven. Make it a part of your daily routine. It can start right here. As people can pray for you after the service. Or maybe you just want to stay in the sanctuary afterwards and use this as an altar as we have in the past. Spend time with him. Set a time apart every day to talk to God and read his word. I will also say there are many in our congregation that have the most beautiful thirst for God. Can I petition you folks to all of Offer an olive branch to your brothers and sisters in Christ. We talk of discipleship. And our church is moving in such a, a wonderful direction here. Pastor Hines, uh, a couple of weeks ago, introduced our congregation to a program being adopted here at New Life Church. It's the ways of discipleship, or Jesus' discipleship pathway. No matter what stage of the journey you are on with Christ, it will challenge you to learn more about our God and challenge you to spread the gospel like we have been commissioned to do by Christ. Seek out those people. They may be your elders, your pastor, your friends sitting next to you. Offer that olive branch. And if you need help, then look for the elders. Look for people and friends that you know have a strong faith in Christ. They can help you with your walk with God. I'll just close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just, uh, we lift up our hands to you, Lord. And Lord, we know that we are a, a sinful nation. We are sinful human beings that do not follow you all the time, Lord. Lord, we offer up that confession. Pray that you give those in this room, Lord, the strength to offer up that confession, to realize, Lord, I can't do this anymore, that I need to hand this over to you, to hand the helm over to God. Lord, we just pray for that strength right now. But Lord, more than that, we pray for repentance, Lord. May each of the people that confess their sins, Lord, that they can repent and they can turn towards you and they can follow you, Lord. They can just immerse themselves in your scripture. Immerse themselves in prayer, Lord. Get to know you and grow that relationship, Lord, with you. How important that is. Lord, we pray these things in your holy and precious name. Lord, we pray on these blankies here today. Lord, we just, we understand that there's some hurting families and we just, this is a ministry we just wish that didn't exist, but it is. And we know, Lord, that there are families that go through this time of grief and loss. Be with those families today, Lord. They don't all know you. But Lord, we pray that through miracles, Lord, and through your Holy Spirit that you bring them closer to you, Lord, for getting that comfort. You are the great comforter. We pray over these blankies into every family that, they'll, that will receive them. Lord, we thank you for our time here today. We glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. stand. Thank you, Vince, for your good word this morning. I love hearing testimonies.
Thank you guys for being here today. I'll just send you out for this week, Lord. We just pray that you guys go and just be a light under the, the earth. We just pray that your, uh, your God's grace and mercy just expounds across you guys this week. Have a great week, and I thank you guys for being here. Amen.